About half past nine on the evening of Wednesday, August 31st, 1977, Peggy Hodgson, a 47-year-old divorcee living in a North London council house at 284 Green Street in the borough of Enfield, had just finished putting her four children to bed when two of them, 11-year-old Janet and her 10-year-old brother John, called down to her from one of the three upstairs bedrooms. Ms. Hodgson wearily climbed the stairs to see what was the matter. The moment the lights came on, both children spoke of hearing an indeterminate shuffling noise, like slippers dragged across a wooden floor. Janet was sure it was coming from a small chair sitting beneath the window between the two beds. Understandably annoyed, Ms. Hodgson grabbed the chair and carried it downstairs, returning to the bedroom a moment later to bid good night. She turned off the light and heard something she didn't recognize, something strange. Puzzled, Ms. Hodgson again switched on the light. The noise stopped. Everything seemed normal, except for the fact that her children had both cocooned themselves within their bed covers. Ms. Hodgson flipped the switch. From the back wall of the room, near John's bed, came a series of four clearly distinguishable knocks. As the wall was shared with the neighboring residents, Ms. Hodgson wondered if the knocks were simply the result of rambunctious house guests. But they were usually quiet people and not known for evening parties. As the baffled mother of four watched, a heavy dresser a few feet in front of her began to slowly slide into the room. Astonished, she pushed the wayward furniture back into place, only to watch it defiantly creep across the floor once more. Trembling from the sudden onset of a nondescript terror, she attempted to push the dresser back a second time, but now found the task impossible, as if some force was holding it fast. The next few minutes were a flurry of action, as Janet and John, and from the other bedrooms, older sister Margaret and the youngest brother Billy, were ordered to gather pillows and blankets and congregate in the first floor living room. Ms. Hodgson's first instinct was to take her family just down the street to the house of her brother and sister-in-law, John and Sylvie Burkham, but she grew reluctant once she remembered the late hour, undoubtedly unwilling to wake someone up over something she was not certain was even real. It was then that Janet looked out the bay window and noticed the neighbor's porch light was on. They quickly clambered out into the night air and banged on the entry of the house next door, that of Victor and Peggy Nottingham. No doubt the Nottinghams found the sight of a middle-aged woman and four children all in night clothes standing on their stoop a bit unusual, but they kindly and dutifully listened as Ms. Hodgson explained the evening's weird goings-on. Victor called his 20-year-old son Gary to join him and agreed to search the Hodgson's home. Sure, an unseen prowler with a weird sense of humor was the culprit, Mr. Nottingham and his son went through each room of the two-story house, going so far as to check the back garden for any pets that could have been responsible. Quote, I went in there and I couldn't make out these noises. There was a knocking on the wall, in the bedroom, on the ceiling. I was beginning to get a bit frightened. Unquote. A few minutes into the search, there was a knock on the outside wall opposite the Nottinghams, adjacent to an alleyway. Victor dashed out the front door, expecting to catch someone red-handed. To his surprise, the neighboring house across the alley was dark and all was quiet. As Mr. Nottingham re-entered the Hodgson residence to confer with his son, the knocks began again, and this time seemed to follow the men around the house. At one point, Gary placed a hand against a wall and claimed to be able to feel vibrations, lending the mystery a decidedly physical quality. Mr. Nottingham returned home and promptly called the police. At about 11 p.m., two Metropolitan officers arrived on scene, Police Constable Hyams and his duty partner, Constable Carolyn Heaps. Expecting to encounter some form of domestic disturbance, they entered the Hodgson residence to find Ms. Hodgson, her four children, and Victor and Gary Nottingham crowded into the living room, all of them rattled. Ms. Hodgson blurted out something to the effect of, I think this house is haunted. Understandably, neither Hyams nor Heaps found the claim very persuasive. In an effort to convince the police of their sincerity, the elder Mr. Nottingham suggested they switch off the lights to see if anything strange happened. Within a few seconds of darkness dappled by the blazing streetlight, four distinct taps came from one of the walls. After a couple of tense minutes, there were four more taps on a different wall. The lights came on and the house was searched once more, the source of the knocks totally elusive. At some point, Johnny Hodgson alerted everyone in the living room to an armchair sitting across the room by a sofa. To the amazement of all watching, the chair began to move. In a later interview, Constable Heaps recounted the incident for BBC News program Nationwide. 
It um, came off the floor, or nearly a half inch, I should say, and I saw it slide off to the right, about three and a half to four feet before it came to rest. Um, I checked to see whether or not it could possibly have slid along the floor. I placed a marble on the floor to see whether or not the marble would um, go in the same direction as the chair did, and it didn't. It didn't roll at all. Um, I checked for wires under the cushion of the chair, and I could find no explanation at all. Because no crime had been committed and no obvious hoax was apparent, the police left the scene at a loss to do anything further. The Nottinghams returned home and the Hodgsons, all of whom were too afraid to venture upstairs, converted the living room into an impromptu sleeping quarters and tried to get some rest. The next day, strange events continued to plague the household, this time in broad daylight. Seven-year-old Billy's marbles and Lego blocks were flung through the house by some unseen force. Supposedly, his mother suspected older sister Janet might be the source, but she adamantly denied throwing anything. Once again, the neighbors were asked to look into the matter, and Mr. and Mrs. Nottingham, this time along with Mrs. Nottingham's father, a Mr. Richardson, joined the frazzled family in an hours-long vigil as objects continued to fly about, clacking against doors and walls, seeming to appear out of nowhere. At one point, Mr. Richardson picked up a pair of thrown marbles and found them to be quite hot to the touch. As on the previous evening, the police were called, though unlike Hyams and Heaps, who were witness to some manner of spooky mischief, no officers reported anything out of the ordinary, though they were sympathetic to the perceived fear being exhibited by the house's residents. The aerial assault continued until Sunday the 4th of September, when Peggy Nottingham telephoned the Daily Mirror, a London tabloid newspaper, in the hopes that they might be aware of someone who could help. The Mirror quickly sent over reporter Douglas Bentz and photographer Graham Morris. The two men spent several hours in the house, witnessing absolutely nothing out of the ordinary, until just as they were preparing to leave, toy blocks began to fly about, one of them clocking the photographer in the forehead as he snapped a picture of the family from the front doorway. Sensing a breaking story of public interest, Daily Mirror photographer David Thorpe and senior reporter George Fallows were the next to arrive. Fallows explained to Ms. Hodgson that she and her children were likely experiencing a poltergeist, a ghostly haunting which primarily manifests in otherworldly sounds and movement of objects. Impressed by the sincerity of the Hodgson family, he offered to contact the Society for Psychical Research, a London-based nonprofit specializing in investigations of paranormal claims. SPR investigator Morris Gross arrived on the scene within a couple of hours of the reporter's phone call. A mature, well-articulated businessman, Morris Gross was a fairly new member of the society, devoting his free time to supernatural investigation with fervent enthusiasm. As with the team sent by the Daily Mirror, Gross experienced very little in the way of activity during his initial visit, although a chair mysteriously flipped over in Janet's bedroom early on the morning of September 8th, an event neither he nor any of the tabloid employees witnessed firsthand. On his second visit the following evening, Gross claimed to have seen a host of lesser phenomena, including a lavatory door opening on its own, door chimes swinging back and forth for no apparent reason, marbles flying through the air and clacking loudly against doors and floors, although strangely never seeming to bounce, sudden cold breezes, and the unexpected movements of clothing and appearance of a mug full of water in the middle of the kitchen floor. Eventually, Gross, no doubt aided by a newly published front-page story in the Mirror, convinced fellow SPR member, parapsychologist, and author Guy Lyon Playfair to join him in looking deeper into the matter. During his visits over the following 18 months, often accompanied by Morris Gross or one of a host of other members of the SPR, Playfair encountered weird occurrences on an almost daily basis. Quote, A very conservative estimate that around 2,000 inexplicable incidents were observed during the case. Unquote. In an attempt to better document the strange happenings, Playfair, Gross, and photographer Graham Morris spent a great deal of time attempting to capture poltergeist activity as it happened. Gross led the effort to record audio phenomena, while, unsurprisingly, Morris focused on obtaining photographic evidence, often using a remotely controlled camera. The result was over 200 hours of audio tapes and a host of pictures of a wholly controversial nature. On the tapes, Gross captured the sounds of objects moving about and thumps on the walls, and the comments made by others present, usually offhand, of said objects moving and doors opening or closing of their own accord. 
sounds of Janet and her sister being tossed out of bed, something gross inevitably attributed to the poltergeist, and typical nighttime chatter among impish siblings comprised much of the early recordings. On December 10th, about 6.35 in the evening, a growling voice was heard near Janet. This was the first indication things were about to become very strange over the ensuing investigation. At first, Janet would bark like a dog. Then, when prodded further by Gross, she would gruffly call out names, such as Joe or Charlie. Profanity, at times quite explicit, was commonplace, as was adolescent giggling, a fact not often reported. Gross would later use this bit of minutiae to support the veracity of the events, openly asking other investigators how such nicely brought up girls could possibly know such harsh language. Such astonishing naivete is undoubtedly born of a man of high moral character, but it will undoubtedly not help his case in the minds of most viewers. Eventually, Gross, along with other investigators, built what could be considered something of a rapport with what came to be known as The Voice, and questions posed to it were often answered in a somewhat disjointed fashion. During these strange conversations, The Voice referred to itself as both Bill Wilkinson and Bill Haylock, and spent a great deal of time discussing sexual matters, including a demand of Denise Burkham, Janet's cousin, to strip nude, and references to braziers, knickers, and hygienic products. Morris Gross's son Richard, a local solicitor, conducted one of the more informative interviews. I want you to tell me whether you remember what happened to you when you died. Just before you died and just after you died. Some of the photographic evidence consists of a number of images supposedly depicting the results of poltergeist activity, scorch marks, objects discovered in strange places, and furniture toppled over. Other evidence supposedly shows the Hodgson children, primarily Janet, during poltergeist attacks. Though certainly worthy enough to give one pause, the somewhat well-known photographs have done little to change minds of skeptics, who rightfully point out several inconvenient facts. Pillows and bedclothes could have been thrown or pulled very quickly by Janet, who would surely have known she was under a camera's watchful eye. A thrown pillow could be interpreted as something more ghostly, if only seen in a series of snapshots. What appears to be a frightened Janet lifted and levitated out of bed could simply be her using the mattress as a springboard, and what seems like a window curtain twisting and wrapping itself around Janet could simply be a combination of a breeze and quick movements by a spry preteen having a bit of fun. Interestingly, Peggy Hodgson had noted the twisting curtain independently, but since only one instance has ever been committed to film, we cannot be sure if she was simply misinterpreting something mundane. Perhaps due to technological and budgetary reasons, video evidence is scant. The little that does exist does not put the case in a favorable light, as it smacks of contrivance and barely contained laughter, though to be fair, the context is not entirely certain and should not be given too much weight. I was going to ask the same question as I asked earlier. How many voices are there? Six, thank you. 600 the voices. Oh, no, it's a joke. <laughs> How many really are there, Margaret? I think so far we've had 10 Three. Um, sensible voices, but the rest of the names are absolute rubbish. How does it feel to be haunted by a poltergeist? It's not haunted. Shut up. Why isn't it haunted? I don't know. Does I'll... it frighten you? The things that happen here. Oh, well, it did first, but now I've got more oh, used to it. Know. And you're going to accept the things that happen. It's like a cupboard, it, Mum. 
my idiot man. Slam a bookshelf at my ear. Have you tried telling it to go away? Yes, yeah. many times. No, it's nothing. Oh, what does it reply? Mm. No, it won't. It's day another six, seven years. Including Ms. Hodgson and her children, as many as 30 individuals claimed to experience, among other things, objects move or levitate, sometimes violently, objects a port, that is, move from one location to another by indeterminate means, the appearance of mysterious handprints, the sounds of rapping and thumping on the walls, often exhibiting intelligent control, and spiritual communication via medium, specifically a ghost named Bill, speaking through Janet. Belief in ghosts is, of course, nothing new, the fear and inevitability of death of primary concern for most people on Earth. And while certainly far-fetched, the idea that a person's spiritual energy, whatever that is, retains some connection and influence on the mortal world is not inconceivable, and is certainly suitable for philosophical examination, if not scientific. Perhaps human consciousness imprints itself on the fabric of space-time, similar to how light imprints on a photographic film, not every life would necessarily create a detectable imprint, just as, continuing with the analogy, not every light source is strong enough to create a clear image. Interestingly, a man named Bill Wilkins had lived in the house before the Hodgsons and had suffered a degenerative eye condition which left him blind before dying of an arterial hemorrhage. These facts were confirmed by the late Mr. Wilkins' son, Terry, in a 1997 interview with Morris Gross. However, in the interview, Terry Wilkins pointed out that, unlike Janet's verbose voice from beyond, his father had been a rather laconic man. Of particular interest is the testimony given by the police officers who responded on the first night, Constable Hyams and Heaps. During her BBC interview, Heaps describes seeing a sitting chair levitate about a half inch off the floor and slide to the right about three and a half to four feet, where it came to rest. She then placed a marble on the floor, presumably to see if the floor was grossly out of level, and thus account for the chair's unaided movement. She further claims that, unable to detect any movement of the marble, she set about checking the chair cushion for any sort of wire. Although he was in the house at the time, sources indicate that Hyams was not, in fact, in the living room, and did not witness the moving chair. Presumably, he had been in the kitchen, attempting to locate the source of the knocks on the wall. Though the exact details are not clear, it is likely Heaps called to her partner once she had seen the chair move, and when he arrived seconds later, he either saw her testing the floor or in the process of searching the chair cushion. This may seem trivial, but it is in fact a demonstration of how simple hearsay can be given the illusion of credibility when originating from a perceptibly reliable source. When speaking to Charles Moses, Vice President of the California Society for Psychical Research, the rather stoic Constable Himes confirmed that he and Constable Heaps did in fact see some paranormal movement of objects, and that there had definitely been, quote, raps and knockings on the house next door, unquote. He also agreed that Heaps indeed saw an object move, and that she used a marble to test the floor. This means very little, since it is obvious Hyams couldn't have been in the living room with Heaps during the chair's movement, otherwise he would have seen it as well, and his report would consist less of a defense of his partner's story, and more of a first-hand account. No doubt Constable Hyams believed Constable Heaps, and no doubt his willingness to back up her claim was sincere and honorable, but it cannot be viewed as anything more than hearsay. Constable Heaps' claims stand or fall all by themselves. Which isn't to say her claims are false. It is very likely that Heaps believed she saw just as she states in her written report and later television interview, and that belief could reflect reality, in which case something genuinely paranormal happened, at least on the first night. However, at the moment in which Heaps saw the chair move, she and her partner had already been called to a house full of highly stressed individuals, told in no uncertain terms that the house was haunted, and then experienced seeming confirmation in the form of unexplainable noises. This series of events would unnerve the most ardent of skeptics, and it is therefore reasonable to assume the constable's perception may have been skewed toward expecting something bizarre. A half-inch of levitation observed from across an unfamiliar room interlaced by shadows is admittedly a somewhat tenuous observation, and oddly enough is only mentioned by Heaps during her televised interview. In an earlier written statement, Heaps expressly states in regard to the chair, quote, at no time did it appear to leave the floor." Unquote. 
It is also worth noting that Constable Heaps was actually made aware of the chair's movement by one of the children, precisely the order of events one would expect if the children were perpetrating a hoax. That being said, the exact method the children could have used is a mystery, as Heaps found nothing that could incriminate them. How did any potential hoaxer know when to manipulate the chair, or that the chair would be a suitable target for their tomfoolery? There was no way to determine if and when the Nottinghams would call the police, and there was no way to know potential witnesses would be in the living room at the proper time, though the possibility of a happy accident of sorts cannot be totally discounted. On the morning of June 16, 1978, American couple Ed and Lorraine Warren, according to John Burkham, arrived out of the blue, presumably insinuating themselves without invitation. Contrary to implications made during recreations of the Enfield events, the Warrens' involvement was actually quite minor, though not entirely insignificant. Well known in paranormal circles as demonologists and curators of a museum of haunted objects, the Warrens wasted little time getting down to business, taking copious amounts of photographs and asking questions, the latter punctuated by an offer to take the two Hodgson girls out to lunch at a local hamburger restaurant. This offer apparently caused some consternation in the household, as Johnny and Billy Hodgson had taken exception to not being invited along. Ms. Hodgson became irritated with the continuous rapid-fire interrogation and the Warrens' generally credulous and patronizing behavior. She noted in particular that the Warrens seemed to have an attitude at odds with the comparatively cautious one exhibited by Playfair and Gross. When interviewed by Morris Gross the following month, the Burkhams and Ms. Hodgson suggested the Warrens were solely motivated by profit. Interestingly, John Burkham in particular observed that there was a noticeable uptick of unexplainable activity during the Warrens' visit, an observation that, upon further reflection, speaks volumes. A somewhat discouraging trend among paranormal investigators is the tendency to ignore the possibility of outright fraud. This could be from a genuine Pollyannaism in which they are unable to see their investigative subjects as anything but angelic victims, or, more selfishly, the unwillingness to profess their own intellectual vulnerability by admitting to having been duped. Whatever the case, one cannot disregard the likelihood that at least some, if not all, of the Enfield events were nothing more than a clever con. The initial events of late August and early September of 1977 were mainly comprised of indeterminate knocks on the wall, tiny objects thrown about, and pieces of furniture moving across the floor. Later events involved, in Janet Hodgson's own words, quote, furniture turning over, cups filled with water, fires igniting on oven gloves and matches where part of the box or the oven glove would burn, but it would go out. Voices, levitation, unquote. Certainly, wrapping one's knuckles on a wall, filling an empty cup from a tap, or lighting a small object on fire would only take a second or two. The settling of a house on its foundation, a common enough occurrence, could account for at least some of the sounds in the walls, so it is entirely possible that either would-be hoaxers took advantage of any spontaneous sounds to heighten verisimilitude, or any natural sounds reinforced whatever supernatural theories were flittering around inside witnesses' heads. As pointed out in a scientific paper regarding the site of another notorious English haunting, an investigation into the alleged haunting of Hampton Court Palace by psychologist Dr. Richard Wiseman et al., those who readily believe in the paranormal tend to experience paranormal events and describe paranormal explanations to unexpected experiences much more than those who do not. And though they are certainly worthy of consideration, sudden materializations and movements of small objects, including toy blocks and marbles, are also not any sort of definitive proof. First documented by psychologists Arian Mack and Irvin Rock, inattentional blindness is a phenomenon in which a subject fails to notice a readily apparent but unexpected visual stimulus because his or her concentration was directed onto something unrelated. In a nutshell, we only see things once we commit our attention to them. Obviously, toy blocks and marbles being cast about could be explained by one or more of the children throwing them, despite protests to the contrary. For the most part, items thrown at or past people in the house were all small, lightweight, and easy to conceal. A toy, marble, shoe, or book could all be carried by one of the children in a manner not easily seen, and then sent hurtling through the air at the most opportune moment. There is also the unavoidable fact that a vast majority of what could be classified as originating via poltergeist seemed to occur at oddly convenient times, especially in relation to Janet Hodgson, who was the undisputed center of much of the activity. 
This suspicious detail was not even lost on the case's biggest apologists, although in a particularly stunning moment of credulity, Morris Gross offered, quote, The thing is smarter than we are. Look at its timing. The moment you go out of a room, something happens. You stay in the room for hours and nothing moves. It knows what we're up to, unquote. This, of course, implies that the supposed victim of said poltergeistian sadism was in fact nothing more than a clever hoaxer trying not to get caught in the act. Some investigators, such as Guy Playfair and Morris Gross, have been steadfast in their beliefs that some of the strange occurrences could not be blamed on the children because they were always within sight and under scrutiny. Not only is the suggestion that the children's whereabouts and activities were under constant surveillance hard to believe, it is provably false. Throughout its existence, members of the SPR have originated from all areas of the arts and sciences, including astronomy, physics, and psychology, with the associated high levels of education. In late 1977 and early 1978, a number of these members visited the house, including psychology student Anita Gregory and former SPR president and psychologist John Beloff. Arguably one of the affair's biggest detractors at the time, Gregory was deeply interested in the Enfield haunting, as it was championed by some of her fellow SPR members. She even devoted a chapter of her doctoral thesis on the matter. Her views, as well as that of Beloff, would take a turn for the worse as time went on. Quote, To begin with, like all the other researchers, I was excluded from Janet and Margaret's bedroom, where the phenomena were supposed to occur. We would all sit or stand on the landing or in adjoining rooms. Then there would be a thump and a squeal. Everyone would dash in and see Janet sitting on the floor, the claim being that the entity had thrown her out of bed." Unquote. If this were not suspicious enough, Gregory convinced Janet and Margaret to allow her to be inside their bedroom during a poltergeist event. While waiting for said event, Gregory was instructed to stand facing the door, her head covered with whatever garments were hanging there at the time after which slippers were thrown at her from behind, punctuated with giggling. As for Gross and Playfair's audio recordings, Gregory, quote, found the voices wholly unconvincing, unquote. She notes that the mysterious voices produced by the children only came in very brief interludes, far from the hours-long bouts of channeling as indicated by Gross. Beloff was of a similar opinion, citing the possibility that the Hodgson girls were adept at some rudimentary form of ventriloquism, and basically having a laugh at everyone's expense. The ancillary fact that Dr. Beloff was not at all convinced, yet seemed to be entirely on board with other less than credible unrelated phenomena, such as psychic surgery and the mental photographs of Ted Sirios, should give one pause. Other doubts expressed by Gregory centered around the video and photographic evidence, and were not manifestly different to arguments made by other skeptics, specifically citing Janet being surreptitiously caught bending metal objects, as well as, quote, bouncing up and down on the bed, making little flapping movements with both hands, unquote. Janet had a reputation as an enthusiastic participant in school sports activities. The oft-published photographs of Janet flying out of bed, it is implied, could easily be explained by jumping off the bed like a trampoline. Eventually, Gregory began to view the entire affair as akin to a joke or a game, and though she made this fact known both at the time and much more vociferously later in ensuing months, she was always quite emphatic that the Hodgson family was always very cordial and welcoming. Though the evidence for a genuine haunting is flimsy, not all the anomalies experienced in the Enfield house can be brushed aside without consideration. Those occurrences at the outset, such as the moving furniture and unexplained knocking, are particularly troublesome, as they are not burdened by the albatross of credulous experts. If the narrative of the first night were known only to the Hodgsons and the case's primary chronicler, Guy Lyon Playfair, one could reasonably conclude many of the details were little more than an imaginative invention. But within the first two hours, not only were Ms. Hodgson and two of her four children direct witnesses to strange events, their neighbors and a pair of unconnected police officers were as well. There may, of course, be some naturalistic explanation for shuffling sounds, thumping walls, and sliding furniture, but a sudden uptick in scurrying mice, water-hammered pipes, and seismic tremors seems almost as hard to believe as a poltergeist. Besides, if these events were nothing more than a hoax, what was the ultimate motivation? It is very unlikely either fame or financial gain was a factor. Peggy Hodgson was never paid for recounting the story of her family's torment, and none of the children ever found anything more than minor notoriety, typically viewed as victims of some unseen force attached to their childhood home. Though Janet was, for a time, mercilessly bullied at school, nicknamed Ghost Girl. 
Indeed, as with most famous hauntings, the address itself has maintained as much infamy in the public eye as anyone involved. It is true that the Daily Mirror was contacted only days into the case, implying a desire for media publicity, but one should take into account that police had been called multiple times, as well as both a local vicar and a local psychic medium, before the newspaper, by some accounts, and only then by Peggy Nottingham, a woman who would later express her opinion of the whole affair to investigator Anita Gregory as pure nonsense. The Green Street House was a council house, a type of public dwelling intended for use by beleaguered working-class families on government benefits. It has been suggested that perhaps Ms. Hodgson concocted the ghostly intrusion as a means to better her family's living accommodations. As observed by Guy Playfair, quote, the house is in a bad state of repair and the furnishings are very poor, unquote. If the shambles around her was shown to be under constant assault from malevolent spirits, something beyond her control, she could rightfully claim the site unlivable and stand a good chance of being allowed to relocate ahead of the housing queue. This possibility was even considered by reporter George Fallows, who pointedly asked Ms. Hodgson if she had intended to move, to which she replied, definitely not. This inertia was also expressed by her to Morris Gross, who had at one time spoken to a social worker about the situation. It was the social worker's opinion that Ms. Hodgson was well regarded in the community, despite her familial and economic hardships, and could be fast-tracked for a housing transfer if she so desired. The obvious fact that Ms. Hodgson seemed to be just as nerve-wracked and confused as anyone, as well as the fact that she continued to live in the house for years afterward, even when unnecessary, would seem to indicate some innocence on her part. Many of the claims regarding the Enfield poltergeist hinge on the reliability of the information related by Guy Playfair and Morris Gross. Although reasonably well written, if somewhat pedantic, Playfair's widely known book on the subject, This House is Haunted, at times comes across as making much ado about nothing, and at others seems to gloss over patently suspicious behavior with willful blindness. Quote, it was perfectly obvious by now that if either of the children was knocking on the floor, their mother must have seen them, and to suspect the whole family was conspiring to deceive us seemed absurd." Unquote. For a man steeped in the ephemeral world of the supernatural, Playfair here seems to lack imagination. Could Peggy Hodgson simply be less observant than he assumed? Or could she have in fact witnessed some mischief and either misinterpreted it or decided to spare her children the public shame and embarrassment of being caught in a lie? It could be argued that both Playfair and Gross, the men who conducted the most exhaustive investigations, had vested interests in the validity of the case and therefore may have been unwilling to see obvious deception. About a year before the Enfield events, Gross's 22-year-old daughter Janet had unexpectedly died in an automobile accident, after which an emotionally scarred Gross became convinced that his daughter was attempting to communicate with him from beyond the grave. The fact that one of Ms. Hodgson's daughters shared the same first name as Janet Gross was certainly not lost on the investigator, and he likely felt a great deal of genuine sympathy to everyone in the household. Playfair was well known as a world-traveling paranormal chronicler, particularly of a series of poltergeist manifestations in Brazil. Despite his initial reluctance to join Morris Gross in looking into Enfield, Playfair found himself deeply involved in the whole affair for over a year and a half. Undoubtedly, revealing the Enfield poltergeist to be an out-and-out -out hoax would have damaged his credibility, branding him as someone who would devote countless months to a fool's errand, and, by extension, possibly weaken the subject of paranormal investigation as a whole. Like Gross, Playfair was by all accounts a very intelligent man. His open credulity in the face of admitted fakery, especially on the part of Janet Hodgson, could be seen as an attempt to mollify skeptical objections, explaining away something done by Janet or her sister as simply an imitation of an objectively real phenomena. Quote, Janet always seemed to be near the site of the action, although she was not always near enough to have caused the incidents by normal means. She had certainly not opened or closed the door, levitated the shirt, moved the chimes, or presumably produced the cold breeze. However, she certainly played a few tricks of her own later in the case." Unquote. Although Playfair states categorically that Janet in particular could not have opened or closed doors, moved objects, set fires, etc., an intellectually honest position forces one to admit that in fact no one actually saw much of anything. Playfair's somewhat breathless account aside, the only evidence we have of anything supernatural are the audio recordings made by Morris Gross and photographs taken by the Daily Mirror staff. In those events that were committed to film, something with arguably much more gravitas than taped audio, especially in the pre-Photoshop era, were hardly unassailable, requiring an extraordinarily generous interpretation to come across as something truly unexplainable. 
Astoundingly, Playfair claims on multiple occasions, Janet performed such miraculous feats as levitating, telekinetic teleportation, and passing bodily through solid walls, sometimes at will. For countless weeks, a professional photographer was either on site or close at hand. If such extreme phenomena were indeed happening, it would seem prudent to diligently watch for and catalog said phenomena by all means available. After all, it would only take a single photograph of Janet levitating eight feet into the air to vindicate believers. Playfair's, and to a lesser degree Gross's, typical reply to this objection is that the poltergeist in question was, for lack of a better term, camera shy, unable or unwilling to directly act upon Janet or anyone else while being directly scrutinized. To say this rationalization is tissue thin would be a kindness. Most of what we know about what took place in Enfield boils down to claims and interpretations made by investigators. That the events seem to escalate in strangeness and become increasingly far-fetched is unfortunate, as it unfairly sullies the earlier quite possibly legitimate incidents of moving objects and mysterious noises, as more level-headed investigators such as Anita Gregory point out. Perhaps more damning than anything else is a 2011 interview with the London Daily Mail, when asked if any of the phenomena she experienced had been faked, Janet Hodgson admitted, quote, I'd say 2%, unquote. Paranormal investigator Joe Nickel later opined, quote, The evidence suggests that this figure is closer to 100%, unquote. Peggy Hodgson departed this world in 2003, ironically coming to an end of her life while sitting in the same chair as a dying Bill Wilkins. Her children have grown and moved on, starting families of their own, though Johnny Hodgson tragically died in 1981. Morris Gross passed away in 2006, and Guy Playfair in 2018. The men maintained friendships with the Hodgsons for the remainder of their lives, standing by their affirmative conclusions. The house has been occupied by at least two different families since the passing of Peggy Hodgson. Subsequent occupants have reported unusual experiences such as the ever-present feeling of being watched and the sounds of people talking downstairs during the dead of night, admittedly hair-raising, if not entirely supportive anecdotes, as the house's ghostly history was well known publicly. Shaka Bennett, a 15-year-old boy living in the house with his mother and three siblings, a strange coincidence indeed, awoke one night to see a ghostly man entering his room though the incident frightened the Bennetts enough to permanently drive them out of the house the following day, the power of suggestion coupled with the phenomena of hypnopompic hallucinations cannot be totally discounted. There's no denying something out of the ordinary happened in the humble council house at 284 Green Street. Perhaps it was something truly paranormal, and a window to another world was opened, the evils within spilling over one innocent family and a group of diligent researchers. Or perhaps, the Enfield poltergeist was nothing more than a bit of childhood mischief gone awry, a creation loosed from its chains by human fear and driven into the dark forest of our minds where it lingers to this very day. <laughs>